Yo, welcome back to Star Spangled Gamblers. I'm your host, Keen Dog. Uh, I'm here with Pratik. Hey. That's, there you go. That's your cue. Uh, today, we've got a special guest. Some of you know him as a stock picker. Uh, some of them know you, some of you know him as a Bitcoin altcoin trader. A lot of you know him as a political gambler. Dennis Sow, where you at? Hey, here from sunny San Diego. Um. I've noticed that that vacuum cleaner tends to just follow you everywhere you go. <laughs> yeah, I made a comment on this earlier. Basically, the idea is if you have a vacuum cleaner out, it basically looks like your apartment is clean. I mean, there's always some lines in the apartment where you can see that the vacuum cleaner has been, but that could be like from months ago. It just, no one has disturbed it. It just, it's the perfect way to make sure that your bachelor pad looks like it's been cleaned recently. It's almost like you work in marketing and not software engineering. <laughs> hey, marketing is a very important skill. Uh, uh, yeah, I definitely pick it up. Hey, listen to Scott Galloway. That's where I pick everything up from. Well, well, speaking of marketing, so you're pretty active on social media. You're, you're a pretty active stock trader. I, I, I would say like observing you from afar from the internet, you really have like four interests, which we're going to talk about today. Uh, stock trading politics, political betting, cats, and your SAT score. So <laughs> what's the first one you mentioned on a date, by the way? Like, do you go straight to the cats or do you start with the SAT score? Oh, no, dude. I, I definitely, I start with one that's not even on that list, which it just started recently. That is anime. What do you call it? I was definitely not a weeb. Boy, if that doesn't get started. you a second date. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I started anime during the lockdown. I've been obsessed with it ever since. So I immediately asked my opening line, on every Tinder match is I ask for anime recommendations. Uh, if they don't respond, great, because that means I, I, I avoid the people who aren't weebs and I get the weebs only. And then so I go, I pick- Wait, wait, a what? What was that? A weeb? A weeb, you don't know what a weeb is? No, I don't know what a weeb is. Oh I've had God. sex before. <laughs> a weeb is just like, so, well, it's, it's supposed to be like a non-Japanese person who likes anime, but I guess it's mm. just right now, just any- any anime person. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Before we move on from the biography, and I ask because we've had uh, extended discussion about trading supplements. Is that an energy drink in the background? Trading energy drink? What are, what are we looking at? Are we looking at that? Yeah. There's uh, a whole... th it's the second pile of garbage to the <laughs> left. All right. All right. Well, oh, dude, this is... All right, all right. Shout out, shout out this brand. This is sparkling ice. This is, uh, what do you call it? What the fuck? Did your mom drop that off? No, no, no. This is from, my, my mom doesn't let me drink sugary drinks. You, you don't understand what's going on. I didn't buy my own. This is sparkling water. This is the best stuff you can get off Amazon. So, so do you need just a little, like, you just need a little bit of sugar, uh, you know, the old fashioned kind, not the nose powder kind? Uh, well, technically it's, this is one of those no sugar drinks, but it's one of the sweetest drinks I've ever had. So I'm not sure what's going on there. You big white claw guy? Some... <laughs> Was that? You big white claw guy? Yeah. Yeah. White claw is the only alcoholic beverage I will drink. Is that your that second, uh, second Tinder question? Uh, no, 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 no. First Understand, it's anime, into cats, and then I asked to see if they're interested in something I'm actually interested in, like Joe Rogan. Uh, that never works. That never works. So and, you uh, actually posted on Twitter. Tw Pratik alerted this to me. You wanted to know, you were soliciting recommendations for how to talk about Joe Rogan and your cats at the same time? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, used, I used the cats debate the match, and then I try to get them to talk about Joe Rogan or some shit I'm actually into, you know. Joe Rogan, you got Sam Harris, you, basically the, the broiest podcast there are, and that never works. So, you know, I got to figure that. I got to figure that out. Well, if you showed maybe photos, if you like dressed your cats up as MMA fighters, I don't know, there might be some sort of overlap there, but people aren't here to listen to uh, stories about your sex life, although I find them right, fascinating. Right. <laughs> uh, we're, we're here to play. So we play a little game on these where we have special, uh, special with the capital S guests like Dennis. Um, uh, just some, some, some bar arguments, uh, some would you rather. So we'll give you like two good options or two terrible options, and we're just going to see uh, what trades you're favoring. So Since let's go big picture. You've, you've made a lot of money trading a lot of random shit in your life. Right now, May of 2020, would you rather bet on stocks or would you rather bet on politics? 100% stocks. Right, first, there's multiple reasons. First off, politics is extremely boring. What are you supposed to bet on right now? 
Uh, there's very few options. The primaries are over. That was the primary draw of predicted in the year 2020, before the general, of course. And right now, there's nothing going on. So obviously, you go stocks. And when you go stocks, I'm 100% long. Uh, I think it's basically, you got the bull case and the bear case. The bull case is very easy, I think. It's uh, the idea that everything bottomed out at the end of March, early April, and everything's gone up since then. You take a look at Apple mobility trends, you take a look at the laws, everything's opening up. So you basically, you think the economy is coming back. That's the bull case. The bear case, they believe that as soon as uh, you start opening these guys up, um, there's going to be a second wave of infection and everything will be forced to close down again and the economy will crash. Now, if that happens, of course, they would be right. But basically what I'm thinking here is that a uh, second wave will not come immediately. I think it's generally well accepted that the virus uh, does very poorly in hot and humid weather that comes with summer. So I think people are uh, overly estimating the impact of the second wave immediately. I, I imagine it'll come later in the fall. So I imagine I'm going to probably sell in August or something, but right now I'm absolutely 100% so in stock. I was under the impression that you had to be smart to trade stocks. And that's sort of implied <laughs> in the question of, do you want to bet on politics or do you want to bet on stocks? Like, I don't know. Do you have, like, if you, if you're betting on predictor right now, there's like certain things like there's almost like an SMP of stocks right. or of predicted, like, is Joe Biden going to be the nominee? Boom, 20% return in, you know, six months or something like that. Like, can you be an idiot and make that type of return betting on stocks right now? Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. If, if you're looking for like guaranteed decent returns that probably beats the, like the stock market returns on average 10% year over year, uh, before inflation. So predicted is definitely better for that. The problem is the $850 limit on each individual bet. So as soon as you reach any sort of scale, that's no longer possible. But if you're, if you're, you know, trading maybe a, a few thousand dollars back and forth, definitely I'd rather actually be on predicted than the stock market at that sort of. Um, so, balance. so let's say that I have like a little brown paper bag full of money that I got from the local liquor, liquor store. Right. Is, is that like, would you rather put that five grand into an S&P fund that rolls over in November? Or would you rather put that five grand? Five uh, grand it, on that sort of scale? Definitely, I think, predicted. I mean, five grand, you're talking about like seven max bets or so. You can easily get it guaranteed, you know, over 10% on predicted, I feel. Especially like the stuff you were talking about with the Joe Biden on, well, Joe Biden nomination at the current price? Absolutely. You know, you, 83 you just, cents. 83 percent chance that the yeah, only Democrat <laughs> running <laughs> That's will be the nominee. Well. If yeah. you talk to anyone, it's, I mean, I'm sure all of your guests totally agree. It, that's very low. It's very fun to play the, 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 the short Biden side, but yeah. the price is just absurd. So, yeah. Um, Having said that, you, I do have 85,000 shares of Amy Klobuchar at one cent. <laughs> oh, who gave you that um, idea? Well, uh, Pratik, Pratik had a very good uh, write-up. I basically agreed with it 100%. But I believe he's playing Amy Klobuchar uh, to win the presidency. Well, I have Amy Klobuchar to win the nomination. I guess it's, it's, his bet gives him longer Are you playing both sides, scale. Pratik? No, I mean, my thought was actually that the presidency was a safer bet because, no, I, I mean, as soon as Biden gets the nomination, you're out of luck there. Um, but if you buy, I mean, so I bought Klobuchar on the assumption that that one can spike if Biden uh, even appears to be thinking about her for VP. And uh, if he does pick her, then you basically get to uh, have an opportunity to get a high return through November on that one. Right. No, I, I totally agree with the analysis here. I mean, the idea of Amy Klobuchar is, well, if you take a look at Amy Klobuchar and compare to Joe Biden, especially if she's picked as VP, she's younger, she's smarter, she's quicker, she has far fewer scandals, she's much harder to attack. You, and she has, and this is the most important part, she has the same uh, neoliberal positions that the establishment loves. So when you take a look at this, you sort of wonder like, why do we have Amy Klobuchar as like the under to Joe Biden? Like, why, why, why don't we just have her as a nominee? I feel like if Joe Biden- A lot of people Amy are Klobuchar, asking that about a lot of candidates. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I feel like so. Uh, you're no stranger to making. Um, well, you've made some really great predictions, and you've made some maybe not quite as great predictions. But the bad ones are good for a laugh, and sometimes the good ones are good for quite a score. But you were hinting at me before this show that you had a you had a pretty audacious uh, call to make for the vice presidency. Right, right. The audacious. This per, this person I'm about to predict is actually not 
a predicted market. So <laughs> well, would you max out? Are you going to tell everyone you do full $850 max out if you had the chance on this? No, okay. Well, okay. No. So there's, there's two issues when you, when you're looking at a VP, one is, is the VP wait, like, wait, wait, is wait. It a good pick? But are you going to max out? No, absolutely not. I'm was, I imagine when, if a, after this pod, goes, so this is all just talk. You, you would never actually bet on this. This is fake well, news. It, uh, it, it's impossible to immediately say off the bat whether I'm not going to max out because I don't know the price it's going to be floating at. One, all right, one cent. I'll give it to you at one cent. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. At one cent, I will max out. No problem. 850 bucks. You put 850 bucks behind whatever yeah. this drivel you're about to tell me is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, Just don't well, say Sherrod Brown again. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to say the pick. The pick is... No, I'm not going to say the pick. I'm no, 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 no. no. Let's, let's get some prelude. Let's get a little drum roll, buddy. All right, right. So, Biden has... Many problems. Well, 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 basically, he has a problem with uh, the progressive side, and he has a problem with um, the people who want like an identity politics pick, who want like a black one. And there is one pick from Roll, which solves all of his problems in this regard. And I haven't heard anyone mention her name. And this pick is Ayanna Presley, easily uh, considered a progressive, also very clearly black, also a woman. Uh, what do you call it? She is a member of the squad, but has managed to avoid all the basically negative controversies surrounding the squad. You take a look at the squad, you have Rashida Tlaib, AOC, Ilhan Omar. All three of those uh, people have been like embroiled in numerous controversies regarding both the left and the right, which Ayanna Presley has managed to avoid completely. She's very obviously uh, the smartest of the bunch. And she's friendly with both the progressive side and the establishment side. If you take a look at the progressive side, I don't think anyone's going to give her crap for endorsing Elizabeth Warren. It's a very smart move for her. And um, on the establishment side, I mean, it seems like she has, if the establishment wants to reach out to a progressive, I think she's by far the one to pick. She's young, she's smart, she's black, she's a woman. You, you know who she reminds like, me of? Like, I'm going to respond to this on its merits first, or second. She reminds me a lot of Lindsay Lohan from Mean Girls. <laughs> no like oh, actually no 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 that, no, that no. Makes, Love me. come on, come on, come on. Come on. yeah like yeah. like aoc is regina george and right now ayanna presley i feel like is really dealing with like Lindsay lohan's conflict she's like well because regina george thinks i'm cool like because i get to hang out with the hot chicks aoc alan omar and all of them i'm relevant but like i don't think she really rolls that way and but like the second that she doesn't want to hang out with aoc anymore she's just not going to be cool so it's like, like, it's literally the Mean Girls conundrum. Like, Ayanna Presley can be herself and not be cool, or she can hang out with AOC and be cool. So, I'll, I, but I think, to, Dennis, that's like completely fake news. She's not going to be the vice president. <laughs> First term well, congresswoman. Let, let, let's get Pratik's opinion, and then I will respond. All right, well, let me read a, a comment from the mailbag to give you a chance to respond. Uh, this is from Nihar. Um, I haven't seen the far left demonstrate the type of electoral importance that would give them as much leverage as media reporting would make it seem. So he's basically challenging your thesis that uh, the far left is actually relevant here uh, for the VP pick. No, absolutely true. The far left has very little political, like electoral relevance in this. If you're talking about basically the battleground voter, we're talking about the white working class in the Midwest. Um, they have very little relevance like actual relevance but the issue is what is the perceived relevance and right now there's a huge perceived gap in joe biden's ability to attract these people and if you take a look at the environment we're in now which in which everything is basically online this very online group of people despite the fact that they are more or less electorally relevant or have extreme cultural relevance in the moment i think there might be some calculation going on as to whether or not they're going to let this huge online faction continue to savage their candidate. Um, I think there should, I think there might be some thinking going on about sort of appeasement in this area. When you talk about that. I, I think these people are busy like buying bumper stickers and selling kerchiefs in Silver Lake and Echo Park and Brooklyn. Like I, 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 that's the only other place that they're overrepresented. And I don't think Joe Biden cares. Like I think we said many times on this podcast that we think Joe Biden was a strong and respected and a powerful vice president. And our thesis is, is that he is motivated to select a candidate who uh, can assume the role the way he did and be the president in 2024. And that all these optical issues are second tier concerns to Biden, you know, yeah, I mean, essentially that, playing the man and not the, yeah, not the yeah, data. That definitely seems like 
uh, the way that DNC established in roles, it seems like they just like going with their guy. And if you take, well, it makes a lot of sense. Their the DNC establishment is very friendly with their sort of media bubble. Um, so basically, they'll reinforce everything that they say. I mean, this would never happen in the uh, Republican side. If you take, or well, if you just compare this, um, basically MSNBC has been like cheerleading Nancy Pelosi this entire time, versus uh, on the Republican side, whenever Paul Ryan did anything. You had Sean Handy immediately calling him a cuck and this, that, and the other thing. So well, um, it's been interesting to see Republican media change from being like, like I feel like conservative media tended to be like very critical uh, up until the Trump years. And now it really is like kind of a party organ for the president. But, you know, the great, right. the great uh, mouthpieces of conservative media didn't really work that way until recently. Right, right. Know. But yeah, I, I was more commenting on the state of like the, party media, quote unquote, when they're in the opposition. So I, I feel like the DNC is very not motivated to do any sort of appeasement. But um, who knows? I mean, at one cent, if I honor probably is trading at one cent, I think that's, that's a no brainer. Um, well, let, uh, let me read uh, a, another item from the mailbag. So this is from uh, Armenian Bacon, who I think shares your intuition that an African American VP would be uh, worthwhile. But he argues one of the reasons I like uh, Abrams is I consider her superior to the non-Kamala uh, African-American contenders, uh, Demings, Bottoms, etc. So, you know, how would you, what, what, what is the advantage of Ayanna Presley over the more kind of recognized uh, African-American women? In Stacey Ab Abrams? Yeah, well, and Kamala. I mean, and well, let's, let's set aside Kamala for a second. Let's talk about Abrams. I mean, Abrams, his stock... Uh, I'm not going to predict it. I'm, I'm unaware of her mo price movement in predicted, but her just stock in general, I think, has fallen off a cliff. It, her puff pieces, I think, have massively uh, blown back on her, and she does not come off as um, someone who appears to be a very strong VP candidate. She's way too into herself and way too like publicly advocating for the role, and she hasn't she hasn't really won. If you take a look at someone like Ayanna Presley, who's actually won um, elect. I think one of the most important things was electability in the primary. Stacey Abrams appears to have no electability. I'm not sure who she would bring, or I, I don't. I don't understand the hype between, behind her or the reason of her getting picked. Um, I think she's like the penultimate example of, of Democratic voters saying they want this type of candidate, black female progressive, and then going out and voting for Joe Biden when the primary, you know. Right. Carnival comes yeah, but I mean, account. there's well, no to, evidence that to, she's even a progressive. So, <laughs> to, yeah. to, to be clear on Abrams, and I maxed out no on her, but I think the argument would be that if you regard Georgia as a state that's in play, um, she might be able to provide the edge there and and put Biden over the top. De Dennis, to what extent are you just like an indie rock guy and you just want to discover a new band before anyone else does? So now you're out here pushing Ayanna Presley on us. Uh. If you're taking that analogy to financial stuff, 100%. In real life, 0%. I listen to the Chainsmokers and I listen to Taylor Swift. So, <laughs> And then you ask girls about anime. Well, let me shift yeah. the conversation. Let's, let's go back to your, your metier. Um, let's talk about another bet on the other side of the aisle. Okay, I'm going to give you two. I, I think these are two dogs. So I want you to pick the worst, the better of two dogs. Mm -hmm. what, what do you like more, the Republicans to win back the House or Carnival Cruise Lines to rebound by November? Well, these are these are two horrible picks, neither of which are going to happen. <laughs> well, you're in the trauma room right now, buddy. <laughs> um, Carnival Cruise Lines to rebound by November seems absolutely impossible. I mean, like, what's I don't understand the argument there. Their their business is just there is is they're undoubtedly going to be doing worse in November than they were in January. So I'm not sure why their stock would ever go back. So I put that at like. 1% probability. If you take a look at Republicans going back the House, you would give it higher than 1%. So I would go with Republicans going back the House, even though I definitely don't think that's happening. I, I guess the Carnival Cruise Line at all, you know what, those are probably correlated bets because you would essentially have to have like a moon rock come down that has like coronavirus vaccine, like Love Mars written on it. Right. <laughs> or for someone to like come out of the black helicopter headquarters and be like, guess what? This really was fake. It's just the flu. It's made up. <laughs> Like, because that's the only way either of those two things are going to happen is, is if, if something ridiculous like that goes down. Right. But um, I, have, I have seen news reports, like basically when, when Disney opened Shanghai, immediately everything was booked. And I think you see this all over the place. As soon as anything opens up, like they're getting flooded. So, I mean, we'll see how quickly everything rebounds. 
I think people are underestimating the speed, but yeah, yeah. definitely I, I, for cruise lines, that's questionable. There's definitely like some public health nimbyism going on here where like everyone says they support lockdowns and then they go out on the street and like have their picnic in the park and like start <laughs> cranking beers again. Like they, they, let's be clear, they support locking down other people. Like they do right, not support right. no, locking down themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, um, Pratik, you want to take the rock? Okay. Um, well, I'll go back to the VP market. Um, would you rather buy Klobuchar to be the VP or Mitch McConnell to lose his Senate election? The markets are priced about equal here. No, I, I, I definitely like, the thing is, I, I'm in favor of Amy Klobuchar VP. I have, if you take a look at like my predictions, I have no on basically everybody and then blank on Klobuchar. Klobuchar is, would be a very good VP pick for what Biden is trying to accomplish here. Um, so I definitely go with Amy Klobuchar to win there. If you're talking, if we just want to talk about Mitch McConnell's chances of winning his Senate seat, I, I would say they're very high. I definitely don't see him losing. I think last time, it, it, he, this is one of those people who are hyped up. The Democrats are hyped up to take him down. If you take a look at what happened with Ted Cruz, it's basically the same thing. They, they, these are they're, Democrats have a hit list of people they want. So they'll hype up anyone who goes up against Mitch McConnell. And I think the last time, they were thinking that it was a toss up and he won by like what 10 or 15 after guy. I, I don't, I don't think this is going to be close. I think this is, this is like the inverse effect of the Trump effect on predict it where like any market that Trump's name in the Republicans have stupidly high odds of succeeding. Right. In. I feel like there's like a Mitch McConnell effect where like he gets partisans hyped up on the other side and the odds always are inflated for Democrats win. that's a great place to be flipping shares on the short side is buy those Dems when they go down to like 12 and sell them when it goes up to like 20, but and that right. seems like a pipe dream to me. So how, yeah. just to follow up on that then, what's your view generally about uh, Senate control? Because I think the, you know, the argument here is that there are a lot of uh, Republican incumbents who uh, have negative approval ratings or, or high disapproval would be another way to put it. Um, but it's sort of unclear whether or not their Democratic challengers are formidable enough. McConnell is one example, but uh, there are a number right. of those out there. Well, Senate control, I mean, I would, the problem with Senate control is, is that Democrats have Doug Jones running, right? Yeah. So, uh, so they started negative that, one. That's a rough one. But I mean, there are absolutely pickup. I mean, if you take a look at Arizona, I'm definitely short on McSally's chances. Yeah, so, I mean, if you take, if, yeah, McSally is in big trouble. So, but the, the thing is, when you take a look at the rest of the map, it looks pretty even-ish like what, what what do you guys think are the flip um the flip markets for the senate like i mean tom which, tillis seems like he's shitting his pants by the way that he's been attacking oh, yeah. his republican colleague richard burr so um that has my attention right no i, I totally agree with north carolina i mean so yeah i would say arizona north carolina those guys are in trouble but the democrats need they if you if you say doug jones is going to lose they need what four? So yeah, <laughs> it seems so. That's that probably like a, a seat in spread. Georgia. Like probably that goes through Georgia. So um, uh, I, I don't. I don't think the. I don't think the. I don't think they're going to lose. I don't think Republicans are going to lose Georgia. I, I think people vote very differently if, in Senate seat Senate elections than gubernatorial elections, and I think the the close race in Georgia for governor's race. I think that was just because of the nature of voting for governor versus Senate. I think, it, I think the whoever, well, if it's not Kelly Leffler, if it's Doug Collins, I think he should win pretty easily. My view is basically that I think that things are generally going to get worse for Trump between now and November. And I think that for reasons I don't completely understand, I think Republicans are just kind of overpriced across the board. I think the most obvious example uh, is Joe Biden. I mean, I, I don't see why he should be trading in the 40s right now, uh, given what we know. I mean, I, I don't think he's going to die or something. Um, so I I kind of just think that I, I, there's also a serious uh, or sort of possibility that Trump is just going to implode uh, altogether, that the bottom's really going to fall out from his support going late into the fall. Um, I also think, too, that it's pretty hard to compare a general election nominee uh, in any race when there is a live primary. So I'm kind of, you know, within reason, betting Dem Democrats across the board wherever, wherever I can with the idea of basically reassessing uh, right after the Democrats get a small convention bounce and going from there. Um, 
There's but just no volatility in these markets right now, though. It's like your my money is just stagnant sitting in them. Like I don't even. Yeah. I might. I might get out now and just come in later. Yeah, I have no positions in any of these. It's simply because, like, I I imagine these will be like close to where they are, or just close to fifty fifty all the way up until election day. The, you know, the swings will be very minuscule. So. But, I mean, but don't you think that, like, take Maine, for example, where right now the markets, in my view, correctly think that Susan Collins is an underdog. I mean, if if my thesis is correct that the Republicans are headed for a, a tough election cycle, couldn't we basically see a point where polling is showing her consistently down like four to seven points and the markets just kind of push that into the 80s? Well, I think okay. so. It, it, okay, let's say her current polling maintains through election day. Yeah, it'll slowly, her price will slowly bleed out. But I mean, it's as, as sort of, as sort of <laughs> might be a little boring. Like, it's, this is one of those things where it'll bleed out very slowly for a long time. And then at the very end, it'll fall off a cliff. I imagine that's, it, it, those, those sorts of price actions happen all the time. You know, people have a lot of hope until it's like one week left. And then all of a sudden, also- people are pricing in the polls. Also, oh, I just saw a kitten walk by, Dennis. Um, the, there's, there's a Carol Baskins in your apartment. Um, the, but the closer you get to the election, the more likely you are to get an overreaction too, which is like a total loser's trap too, that you're like, oh, there's going to be like, you know, that one good news story or that one good poll and I'm going to be able to get, and you know, no, game over, your money's Right. <laughs> no, I agree. Now, uh, I want to comment something earlier Pratik said um, about Trump, Trump chances you know, getting worse or something. I think if, if the election happened right now, he would absolutely get blown out. He would lose Florida, which many people have predicted, including myself, consider sort of like a safe-ish Trump state based off how they voted in 2018. But I mean, if you take a look at his polling right now, he's extremely underwater with seniors, which is um, which basically accounts for the entirety of his polling discrepancy against Joe Biden right now. So all, he, what he, if, if as we approach November, he manages to like make healthcare, which is always a pro-Democrat issue. Healthcare, like Democrats win that 100% of the time, every single time. And because of the coronavirus, this is a major you know, issue in the news right now. But if that fades, that's his only chance. He needs to, he needs to make this a partisan thing between like the economy and healthcare. And um, like, <laughs> because if, if it's just status quo into November, he's gonna get blown out. If well, he I loses sort of wonder to what extent his popularity, this is all like very speculative and I feel like right. we're, we're drifting away from why our users are here, but yeah. like as, as summer goes on and like some degree of normalcy returns, and then there's some credibility to lend to, listen, we didn't overreact. Like we did, y- y- now you're thankful that you know, all the stuff that Trump's been saying for the last couple of months that people have been like, bro, like, have you seen these body bags over here? Like that those viewpoints will become more favorable throughout the summer. And then that cliff that you sort of described in the fall will reverse that trend yet again, when, when the, the disease comes back, something like that, that maybe there's some I mean, that, that might come there. like after the elections. I mean, we'll, see. well, like if I were Trump's campaign manager right now, I would immediately, I mean, I think he's already- You probably this. could be, by the way. Right. <laughs> well, I would immediately start politicizing the lockdown. Like, because he's, because I think it's generally agreed that he sort of fumbled the initial, resp- the medical response. Uh, he, he should just make the argument that he's like the pro-economics guy and basically make the gamble here that by November, the economic situation will be way more on people's minds than the medical situation. If he manages yeah, position himself as sort of the, the populist reopen guy uh, at November, I feel like that's one of his only chances he has. So. Well, we just, I think we just saw that in that special election in California 25 where Mike Garcia kind of, I feel like he pulled a Scott Brown and like ran again, instead of running against Obamacare, he like kind of ran against like, overreach and lockdown and did it blah, 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 blah. so I, I think i think what you just elaborated will be what we say right there was this um there's this graphic tr- uh trending on twitter very early initially in the lockdown is it anime it basic- no <laughs> this is politics it's basically you know one of those things where it says you know if the lockdowns work people will have to say we don't need it and you know this is one of the things i yeah. agree on but trump should po- use this as a political weapon you know it's it's very uh, you know, uncloth to say, but it's, it's one of the things that's, I think, very clearly panning out right now. And he should absolutely just politicize or use this to his advantage and say the lockdowns weren't needed at all and be the anti-lockdown guy. So, I mean, so I looking think- at your apartment, I suspect that you've been social distancing for about 23 years. <laughs> Dude, this was very, this was actually very clean until I got my cat. And then I sort of just 
because I've, I've read everywhere that you're supposed to enrich the environment by making it sort of messy. <laughs> That's my excuse. Uh, well, I'm glad to know that you put others before self. Real quick, so we're, we're getting down to the last quarter of our show here. What, so we've sort of been nipping around the edges. We've been, been doing a little gambling catnip about chasing conspiracy theories for enormous gains. What, like, where's the better place to do? Like, do you have better luck, like, following really weird hunches on Predict It? Or do you have better luck following, like, really, really strange wormhole hunches, uh, betting kind of conspiracy theories on stocks? Um, so, okay. So, quickly on stocks, I definitely don't bet any weird penny trades or any weird conspiracies on stocks. I'm just extremely leveraged on the long side on stocks everyone agrees with. Everyone agrees with Amazon. Everyone agrees with Facebook. So I'm definitely not a conspiracy guy when it comes to stocks. When it comes to predict it, it's just extremely fun to be on the conspiracy side. It's very fun to have one cent shares of Amy Klobuchar. Um, but I mean, is, is, it, is it profitable? No. I, my, my conspiracy bets never pay off. <laughs> I make all my money on like election day or like just previous to the election on like just election results and they're mostly we're on the mill standard stuff. You, you crack me up talking about how nothing's going on on Predict It. And I'm like, I live for the non-election markets, like the weird asymmetric, like how will this politician behave or will they say that, you know, like, like that's right. Fucking elections where you data guys are doing whatever software engineer shit that you do. Like, I'm not going to beat you. I'm going <laughs> to beat you in these asymmetric markets that are, that are real hot right now. Well, I mean, the, the real honeypot markets are the ones where a, a guy states an intention to do something and hasn't filed officially, so the rules are kind of murky. And then I'll see Jipkin on Twitter point this out, and I'll, I'll immediately just bet the wrong side. I have never clicked on one of Jipkin's Twitter links to say, oh, will he file and place a correct bet? So, you know, are, you, to... are you a Jipkin truther? Are you, are you saying that maybe he's turning into a Twitter pumper? <laughs> or are you getting reverse pumped by Jipkin? All I'll say is that I have lost a significant amount of money to Jipkin, and I'm not sure I've won any of his money. So, <laughs> well, he probably has a spreadsheet that can tell you exactly how much of of, of your money he has and his money you have. I guarantee right. you, he's got some some sort of some of those. Are, do you do you have like with your Superman software skills? Like, do you have bots? I'm not saying trading bots, but do you have like tools, developer tools that you've used to collect data and shit like that? Uh, to, to collect data, absolutely. To trade and predict it, there, there's very little point because the volume is is too low most of the time for bots to do anything. I mean, I think when initially people are talking about bots, they're talking about like on the tweet markets and it just is, I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> but so, so what kind of data are you scraping? Basically, so the most important data to scrape is on election day. You, if, you can, if you can get real time county vote data, you can compare it to how they voted in the previous election or to whatever election you want to compare it to. And then you, you can immediately infer the swing in, you know, is it, you know, an R plus one swing, D plus three swing. And then you can just apply that swing to the previous election results or however you want to calculate it to come up with a prediction really fast. And that, that's basically where all the profits come from on election day. That's the, by far the most profitable thing you can do. So if I find a girl who likes Joe Rogan in anime, will you give me your who's he what widget machine that you just described? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you, th you think that's a fair trade? You'd pay like 10 grand for a girl who likes Joe Rogan? 10 grand? I, it would be free for me. <laughs> Maybe lost potential problem. Maybe an additional competitor. But I mean, we'll see. That's right. You might be paying, you know, five cents instead of three cents for some of those right, shares right. because... <laughs> You'd have the old keen dog nibbling around your yeah. your 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 kibble bowl. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, we got a couple of minutes left. This is the time where we sort of pass the blunt around the horn and get any get any last anxieties out. Uh, Pratik, you got anything left on your notepad? Yeah, uh, Dennis, I actually wanted to ask you about your interest in SAT scores. So, do you think that a high SAT score is a predictor or an indicator of someone's ability to be good at betting and prediction or are these kind of unrelated uh, forms of also why are you uninterested in female companions sat scores or are you only into their looks and their joe rogan accounts no no i'm, I'm very interested well it, you, you can the thing is when you're talking about intelligence you don't need to ask for their scores to determine if a girl's intelligence you can just talk to them and figure that out but uh, in terms of Pratik's question you know higher scores are definitely going to be better i don't think there's any argument for worse test scores being better um, I think if you take general intelligence is one of the best predictors of how you're going to do in life. And, you know, as if the SAT is trying to predict that, then higher is absolutely better, I imagine. Will so you I, be picketing your alma mater for dropping SAT scores? 
Dude, that is such a stupid decision. I'm not sure what's going on. <laughs> the like, University of S- California no longer taking SAT scores. Well, um, I mean, supposedly it's only until 2023. But, you know, I'm definitely, well, obviously I'm biased because I'm an Asian guy with good grades, high SAT scores, and no extracurriculars. So, hey, you're handsome maybe, as fuck, too. Yeah, I'm not the most objective person when it comes to this. So, I mean, I was accepted solely on the basis of my scores. I had no extracurricular, so I'm mean, whatever. The... Uh, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think general intelligence is uh, across the board uh, predictive of any number of things. But, you know, and, and I do actually ask for people's SAT scores when they uh, want to be in my predicted group. But I, I do, I have some doubts in the sense that I think uh, prediction is a very different skill from expertise or any or analytical ability or any number of the other things that smart people in our society usually have. And um, you see all the time people who are very intelligent who can't predict anything. And then we've also come across people, um, you know, who may or may not be all that distinguished in their careers, but they're just really good at picking uh, political outcomes or whatever. So like, what what do you make of that? Well, issue? I mean, that sounds like I would agree with you back in a, in a few years ago. But if you take a look at the, the, the political prediction environment now, you have lots of people shooting from the hip. And then you have, you know, people like 538 and you have Nate Silver, which is clearly sort of an analytical, probably a high SAT score dude. And I would, you know, I would go with his predictions well over, you know, any of the random guys who are just firing off. You take a look. I, mean, I remember like the Morning Joe had, uh, they had like a round table and they all predicted that the Republican win the governor's seat like back in 2018. I mean, these people are wrong all the time when you're talking about predictions. I think the data guys definitely have an edge. I mean, you have a few people on Predict It who say, you know, Nate Silver sucks, this, that, and the other thing. But <laughs> I think Nate Silver, if he, if he played, he would do very well. So I, I'm sure he I, I would be, well, I've heard that they're not allowed to over there, but uh, I can certainly I mean, just, find that. Who, who decides he's not allowed to? I mean, he, Nate's the boss. <laughs> he, yeah. he, he probably decided himself. I, I consistently find that people who are like insiders have the worst information and the worst predictive skills. Like if I have right, someone I in a senator staff tell me that something's going to happen, I know it's not going to happen. Yeah, anyway, well, so great, great predictor, Dennis Sow here. You want to say goodbye to your fans? Yeah, goodbye. Well, I, I'll, have, I'll say one more thing well, in the time we have left. Uh, in the, the election in November, Indiana reports first. You can infer a lot from the results on Indiana. That's what I did in 2016. You have a few counties in Indiana which work, and you can just extrapolate that to the rest of the Midwest and you should know who wins by uh, 5 p.m. Pacific. So, all right. That's this is Star Spangled Gamblers. I'm Keen Dog. I've got Pratik with me, Dennis Sow, the real Dennis Sow. This has been fun, guys. Looking forward to doing Thanks. it again sometime.